So assessing the overhead reach. We're going to assess shoulder mobility, um, looking at latissimus dorsi, pectoral, rhomboid length, glenohumeral mobility, scapular mobility, AC, SC joint mobility, um, biceps, trapezius, deltoid strength. We can also look at thoracic mobility, both looking at the spine and the facet joints, as well as the coastal vertebral joints and the ribs. And then trunk stability, is there enough length to the retrospinae and the thoracolumbar fascia? Is there enough strength to the transverse abdominis to let the movement occur? So I use this with patients who complain of pain in the neck, um, upper back, shoulder, low back. I worked at a community college once and um, I was with the volleyball team and I don't know if many of you have had interaction with coaches, but it tend to be a little gruff. Um, the, the majority of the players had low back pain. He's like, well, they don't hit with their backs. That shouldn't hurt. So we, uh, we had to figure out what was going on and you'll see what was going on with them as we get into this screen. Um, again, specifically with athletes with overhead population, tennis for the serving motion, um, volleyball, basketball for non-athletes looking at industrial workers, but also geriatric population um, looking at fall prevention. Because if they don't have enough shoulder mobility to reach something on a top shelf, they're going to start tiptoeing, which is going to throw their balance off and put them at a greater risk for falling because they don't have appropriate shoulder mobility. So um, going in and looking at our personal trainers again, uh, giving you a little more history on the one on the right, like what, what does your workout routines consist of? He's like, I bench press. Like, okay, <laughs> anything else? Like sometimes I'll do some sit-ups. So based on that, what do we see with his uh, shoulder mobility? Internal rotation. A lot of tightness in the front. Normal mobility on this, um, thumbs go together and you take your arms straight up. And if you have tightness or impingement type symptoms, you start lying out to work around that. So that's looking at him from the front. If we look at his counterpart from the side, what do we see through there? Arching in the back, too much lordosis. His back should be flat. How about at the shoulder itself? He's not at 180 degrees. And, and that's where the volleyball players were having the low back pain. They couldn't reach up, so they were hyperextending through the low back to get their arm up higher for the overhead hit. Um, typically, if you tell someone to try to touch the wall behind you, they're going to do something to try to touch the wall behind them. Um, a lot of times, they'll extend the wrist. He is. That's as much wrist extension as he has. Remember, he's the one that deadlifts, and he's holding 450, 500 pounds that he's deadlifting. His finger flexors and his wrist flexors are so tight that that's as much neutral as as much extension as he has with that. Because that, that was something I did cue him on after the work. And we draw in some lines and see what happens. Who's my massage therapist today? Oh, a couple. Okay. Um, for massage therapists or geriatric population, if you want to put them down on the table and have them go through the same movement, um, believe it or not, even though gravity should be pulling them down, they're still going to arch up to try to compensate with that. So again, the primary restriction tends to be the latissimus dorsi. There's just a friendly reminder of its attachment points. Um, can I have a, a shoulder person come up? Sometimes I do it against the wall. Sometimes I just have them do it out in the open. So if I'm having them just do it in the open, um, still want to position the feet the right way. Feet hip width apart, both feet pointing straight ahead. Because if they externally rotate, that's going to take the tension off gluteus maximus, which ties into the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia. So they'll actually have more shoulder mobility because of that. So keys are thumbs together. And just take your arms up and above your head as high as you comfortably can. And we see what happens. So what do you see? So he's arching a little bit through here. He's got a little bit of a lean going on. Notice how the left arm goes higher than the right arm, though? Now, the thing that jumps out at me about that, if you'll turn and face them, 
is this huge scar through here. So that's going to tension the fascia of this arm, and that may be why he's restricted through there. Um, so what I'm going to do, oh, he's arching a lot through the low back too. Um, so I'm going to have him put his arms down. I'm going to have him go on his back. Head that way for me, please. So I'm going to have him bend both knees up. That's going to drop him into a posterior pelvic tilt. So he should be able to keep his back flat then. He's still not going to be able to, but the theory's there. Um, so I'll have you put your thumbs together again. Take your hands back. And you'll see he still arches up, and he can't go down all the way. Now, in order to actually check the lats, we're going to straighten his legs out. That's going to take the tension off, and you should see that his arms drop a little bit. If we increase the tension by tensioning the thoracolumbar fascia more by taking him up into flexion, see how his arms start to come up then? So that confirms that his lats are tight. If his arms stayed in the same position the whole time, then we're looking more at pecs or rhomboids or teres being tight. So we would need to further investigate those areas. Okay, thank you. Questions about the overhead reach? Okay, let's go ahead and break into groups again. Um, don't use that wall, because I don't think it's very stable if you choose to go against the wall. Of course, this wall is not much better because you've got the chair runner there too. So. Okay, since you're going against the wall, there's a little bit different setup. So I'll walk both groups through it at the same time. Um, because we're bigger through our glutes, we have to compensate for that. And that's where the posterior pelvic tilt comes into play. So um, we're going to take hips, heels, and shoulders should touch to begin with. We're going to take the feet a foot out from the wall. Now, when I was originally taught this version, a foot was 12 inches. But 12 inches for her is going to be a lot more than 12 inches for me. So we're going to standardize it to the patient's foot. So heel in front of toe, keeping the back against the wall, heel in front of toe. So that drops her into a posterior pelvic tilt, takes the glutes out of play, and then she's able to go into the movement from there. There's always one that I can say hi <laughs> around. So yeah, she has a lot of curve. And it's one of those things you can't cheat the test because if she goes in and she tries to flatten, then her arms compensate in somehow. <laughs> 